cooperative cat, they call it. And then we'll go through some slides to look at abnormal so that that kind of helps you know what's normal, what's abnormal. And then my cooperative beagle will get an exam at the end. So you'll have an opportunity to kind of see what the exam entails and then also go through abnormalities and then see another exam. And then we'll open it up to q and A. I'm happy to try to answer any questions uh, at that time. Um, so that's our plan for tonight. And the first question is why do we perform home checks? And a big part of that is that we wanna be able to catch fixable problems early. So your own pet may have some subtle changes that if you're not scrutinizing, you will miss. And uh, certainly I've, I know I've found on during physical exams when pets come in things that owners hadn't noticed at home. And part of that is just making sure that you look and many of you are already pretty observant pet owners. And please note that this is not intended to replace uh, the annual exam with your veterinarian, still taking your pet to the veterinarian is important. This is our goal of to say, let me know what normal is for my pet and let me get familiar with that so that I can notice when things change. And that's, that's the point. Also controlling weight gain. So one of the things we wanna watch that our pet doesn't get too skinny, our pet doesn't get too fat. And you can actually, you've probably heard the adage, you should be able to um, feel the ribs, but not see them from a distance. And those are some of the things that, that people will use to try and help determine whether weight's becoming a problem. The other thing you do with a home exam is teach your pet accustomed to become accustomed to being touched. And you may, if any of you that have gotten kittens or puppies uh, may have had your vet say, hey, as much as you can, look in their mouth, touch their ears, touch their feet, do these things that help them get used to letting you look so that when problems happen, foxtails, ear infections, you're brushing their teeth is something you wanna do that you're already making them comfortable with that kind of tactile stimulus and that they don't avoid it. Obviously some pets are more uh, cooperative about that than others. So uh, it, go, it ranges from pet to pet. So the first part is we're gonna do a, a very much a home exam of my kitty Boris and uh, we'll go through the parts of that exam. This is Boris, he is my own cat. Um, and a great model for things like this. So when I do an exam, I mentally kind of say from the toe to the tail. So I kind of go in order when I look. So one of the first things I'll do is look at their face for symmetry. You know, if there's an eye that's winking or a side of the face that's swollen, then that's a signal that something could be wrong. So you want to see that the eyes are symmetric and Boris's ears are gonna go back when he doesn't like what I'm doing. But a quick look in the ears is a good idea. A quick look at the eyes, if you can get them to open their eyes, see if there's any discharge from the nose. And then if they'll let you look in the mouth, you wanna see that there's nice, oh, I just found that he probably has a tooth problem, uh, pink gums and that the teeth look okay. Uh, so on this side, things look good. Not every cat will let you do this, but I like to look in their mouth. So I'll use the, their cheekbones to open their mouth and look back there. And I see that my cat needs some dental work. So that's what I'll do around the face. Um, then uh, obviously at the hospital, I'll be using a stethoscope to listen to heart and lungs, which isn't an at-home option. But I do like to feel under their neck to feel any asymmetry or swelling. And then there's lymph nodes in that area too. So if there's uh, something big that you feel, then that can help um, determine whether there's a problem. Um, otherwise, I try to look at the skin, make sure that there's no flea dirt or any weird uh, masses. And a lot of times you can feel lumpy bumpies. And when we get to my dog, you'll see lumpy bumpies and what they look like. Um, if they'll let you, rolling over and just kind of running your hands down their body. Uh, Boris really doesn't like me just to comb his belly, but he'll let me do it often. So I'll just take a swipe down there and down the legs. If they'll let you look at the Claws, that's a good thing to do, or between the paws, and quickly kind of feeling along the arm to see if there's anything that you uh, that hurts, any area that hurts, especially if you see that your dog or cat is lame. And you can do the same thing with them standing, just kind of feeling down the bones to make sure there's not an area that hurts. And then uh, it's not a favorite thing, but looking under the tail to make sure there's no problems there, and then feeling along the tail as well. 
So I found out that Boris has a dental problem in his upper molar there with um, that exam, but otherwise he seems like he's a pretty healthy. All right, so um, I, he is a healthy 14 year old cat is what that video was meant to say after that. So now we'll go through each part of what that video talked about and I'll give you examples of where, um, where you might find some abnormalities. These examples are pretty extreme. So uh, it's not what you're gonna see overnight at home, but I wanted to make sure everyone kind of understood what you might look for. So this is a dog with facial paralysis. And you can see if you kind of divide his face in half, this side has a droopy lip, the eyes a little bit more closed. So that's a nerve problem. And people, they call it Bell's palsy. So what happens is the nerves uh, that innervate those muscles are affected. And so you get a droop. And that's a good example of asymmetry. Here's a kitty cat with an abscess on his cheek. Cats who are fighters tend to uh, get bit either the, the ones that stand up for themselves get bit in the face. The ones that are trying to get away get bit in the back end. But you can see on this one that this there's asymmetry in the eye because there's this swelling here that's an abscess on this kitty's cheek. And so that's some of the places that you'll see facial asymmetry. And then looking in the eyes, these are some examples of changes that can happen in the eye. Again, these are pretty extreme, but there's a syndrome called cherry eye uh, dogs and cats have what's called a nictitans or a third eyelid that kind of comes up from the nose side. And when uh, I'll try to show you that when we examine Stuart, but this is a, something that can have cartilage thicken or flip out. So this dog has actually gotten a flip of that cartilage in the third eyelid. And you can see that that right eye has this little cherry like thing poking out. And then there's a cataract. Uh, so you can see that this beautiful picture of a lion that we found on the internet and credit to that photographer, uh, that the right eye has a cataract in a blue haze and the other one looks like a normal eye. This kitty cat has a little bit of an infection in its right eye. So again, there's that third eyelid we just talked about. You can see it coming up a little bit. There's redness compared to this healthy blue eye here. And then glaucoma will actually show up as bulgy eyes. So that's a pressure change inside the eye itself. And those eyes will look bigger and then they'll also get a blue haze because the cornea gets changed by the blood flow or pressure in that eye. So nose and mouth concerns. Again, we're looking for symmetry, discharge changes when we look in the nose. So here's a dog with some nasal discharge. Those of you who've dealt with foxtails in this area know that you can get a bloody discharge, you can get a serous discharge. Dogs with a foxtail will sneeze a lot, so they have a lot of other clinical signs that will show when there's a problem. Um, this particular dog has a fungal infection, and there's a pretty characteristic opaque discharge there. This kitty cat also has a disease called cryptococcus, which is a fungal infection that can change the architecture of the nose. Uh, and if you didn't know it was your cat and you didn't look at it every day, you might not notice this kind of change because there are cats with handsome Roman noses that might look a little bigger normally. And here's a side, side view of a similar thing. So this kitty, the bridge of this kitty's nose has architecturally changed. And that's something to pay attention to. And that can be an infection, it can be a bacterial infection, uh, fungal infection, other things. And unfortunately, architecture change in the nose can be more serious. And then looking in your dog's mouth, I thought this was a good video, a pre and post bit, uh, picture of dental cleaning and really the pinkness of the gums and how irritated they look here. Obviously the tartar's irritating the gingiva and after a dental cleaning, you see that the gums look a lot smoother along those lines. And so that's something that you can look for for trying to figure out if there's a problem. Also, if they'll let you look in, in their mouth, then seeing uh, any abnormal growths or changes in the architecture of their mouth is helpful. And again, I know that's one of the more challenging things to look inside the mouth. But there's some examples of abnormal. And then lumpy bumpies. So one of the things I wanted to do is quickly say, where are the lymph nodes in dogs and cats? So there's five, there's, they're symmetrical nodes. So there's five on each side. But where the submandibular, which, you know, when all of us were kids and we had a fever and our mom would be like, oh, let me check your glands. 
So that's your submandibular and you'll feel them get swollen when you have an infection, especially if it enters through your respiratory tree. And then right in front of the shoulder, there's a lymph node called the prescapular, the armpits and the inguinal area, and then behind the knee, something called the popliteal lymph node. So those are places that people can just feel to see if there's abnormalities. This is a photo of a dog with a swollen lymph node. That's the submandibular lymph node. You can see that it's kind of directly down from the ear there. And then for cats, um, they can actually get hyperthyroidism. They can get changes in their thyroid. And this picture is actually a cat whose thyroid, um, people may call it a goiter. So it's a thyroid that's overactive and the gland has hypertrophied. So it, it looks pretty big. And that's something that you can find on your cat. You can have very benign masses in these areas too. So I don't want anyone to find something and immediately draw some bad conclusion. I have, I have one kitty I treated with a very big benign sebaceous cyst on his neck for the last 10 years of his life. And it's not a problem, it just feels weird. So getting it checked out, documenting that it's not a malignancy or something serious, that's part of why we're doing these exams so that we can say, do I have to worry about this or not? Lameness is, a, is another thing. There's a bit of a fine art to it, not being an orthopedic surgeon. It's not my, uh, one of my fortes, but one of the things you can, you can notice is that a change in gait, besides the obvious pig holding up a foot, is that you can see in the head sometimes which leg is, is bothering the pet. So dogs with a front leg lameness um, will bob their head a little bit as they swing the lame leg sometimes. So if you start to see that your, your pet is bobbing their head more or a cat that seems to favor them. And part of, I didn't cover this in the exams, but one of the things you can do is if you're looking and say, thinking, oh, I think one of the back legs is bothering them. Pets who have a lame leg, if you pick up the good leg and make them shift the weight onto the, uh, the painful leg, they'll be very reluctant to let you do that. And so with my internal medicine skills, orthopedics aren't one of my fortes during my examinations. If there's a lameness concern, if I pick up a leg really easily and the other one trying to pick up and the dog really won't let me, that tells me that they're not, they're trying to avoid shifting weight onto a painful leg. So that can help you figure that out. The more obvious things, this dog is toe touching lame in that left rear leg. And when it hurts to bear weight, they're gonna do that. They're gonna swing it around. And that's more of a motion thing, but you can certainly feel down the leg very gently. You have to be careful because you don't want to hurt your pet nor get bit if they uh, have a fear reaction. So that's something you'll have to do with caution. And weakness is another thing that you can see. So here's a dachshund who's obviously had some paralysis or weakness in the back legs and they're prone to intervertebral disc disease what happens is a disc will come up and compress the spinal cord and cause some weakness in the back legs. And we, um, that's something that needs immediate attention, either through rest or in some cases surgery. But this dog obviously is in a cart because of that. And then this kitty, this is what I call the plantigrade stance. So this kitty looks like somebody cut the high heels off their shoes. And part of that is something we see with neuropathy, um, diabetes can cause that and other types of neurologic uh, issues with cats. So um, those are some of the things that can cause lameness. And then lumps and bumps, besides the lymph nodes that we went through, um, some other types of things you can see. This is a kitty cat with an ulcerated mass. And ulcerated masses are always a little more concerning than, than smooth ones that look like normal skin. This is actually a mast cell tumor, which are not as dangerous in cats as they are in dogs traditionally, but definitely a concern. And then here is a very benign wart. So this dog, this is just a little um, skin proliferation that doesn't have any pathology to it. So these are the kinds of things that I would recommend, you know, watching um, if you are nervous about, has it changed? The, the, one of the great things about a smartphone is that you can take a picture of it and a month later, take another picture of it. And you can also do things um, to, to objectively measure it. This is a cyst between the toes of a dog. Those of you who've had a dog with a migrating foxtail, that's what it'll look like. You can also get um, something called pododermatitis, which is just an infection 
And because that area is stays moist, it can be challenging sometimes to control infections there. And you can see how it almost looks like something wants to come out of it, like a, a rupture. And that's something you would find by examining them at home. And then this, which is a benign, it's what we call sebaceous cyst, and this kind of cauliflower appearance to it is these um, warts that will happen in dogs over time. And so if there's that kind of cauliflower look, you may want to, you know, certainly get to the vet, get these things checked, but it's not as um, dangerous as some of the other types of changes that you might see in the skin. And then this x-ray or this picture is very interesting because severe skin infections can look the same as this is actually unfortunately a, what we call T-cell lymphoma. So you can get an unusual form of skin cancer, but it can look a lot like an infection. There's a lot of, it's kind of a Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlap, but you certainly wouldn't want to say, oh, this looks like an infection. Let's treat it lightly because one, you can, the sooner you diagnose it, the better, but two, um, a skin infection is going to get better with the right treatment. And if it doesn't, then we have to look for other causes. So that's kind of wrapping up what we talked about, um, except we didn't talk about under the tail. Nobody's favorite part. So this is a very obvious uh, picture of asymmetry in under the tail. This dog has an anal gland problem, and it would be something that you would see right away if you were doing the under the tail check and would probably want to um, get that investigated soon. And scooting is another thing that people will see their dogs and cats do when there's problems with anal glands, whether they're impacted or infected or uncomfortable, they'll do a little floor scoot. And that's an observation you can make. And looking under the tail helps you figure out if there's asymmetry there. And then just looking at the skin. So you can get a dermatitis under the tail. You can get other things where the skin should look symmetrical. It shouldn't be red or irritated. Um, and certainly I, not everyone likes to look at their pet's bums, but it does help catch things sooner if we do a quick, I call it under the hood check. So, all right. So now that you've kind of seen a bunch of abnormals, what we'll do is have you uh, have, have a watch of watching a, sorry, a physical on a dog. So. So now we've gone through some slides of what abnormal looks like, and we'll repeat this exam on Stuart. So same thing, uh, nose to tail, try to start at the beginning. So take a look at symmetry. One of the things that I talked about with Boris is that you can actually look at the third eyelid, which is uh, something do people don't have, but if you push on the outer part of the eye, you can raise up that part of the eyelid. So looking for symmetry in the face, looking at the nose to see if there's any discharge, one side looking any different than the other. Also looking in the ears. Um, Stuart spends a lot of time digging out on the hill here, so you can see some of our property in his ears, but otherwise he's doing pretty good. And then trying to look in the mouth, look at the teeth, make sure things aren't concerning there, not too much tighter, tartar or that the gum line looks healthy. And then also, if you can, get them to open up their mouth and take a quick look in there. That was a quick look. Sometimes that's hard here, Stuart. Let's give them a better look than that. Okay, good boy. And then after that, going down the chin, I feel under the angle of the jaw for any lumps or bumps, any changes in the neck, any um, those lymph nodes that we talked about are here under the chin and then some under the armpit. And so just feeling along the body. Mm -hmm. Yes, Stuart can see his treats from here, so he's gonna complain a little. Let's put you the other way, buddy. So one of the things about Stuart is he'll be nine this year. Mm -hmm. So he, he got some lumps and bumps here on his belly. You can see some irregularities, and these are all fatty tumors that we've examined. But I like to feel them and make sure they don't get bigger, that they don't get firmer, that I can still move them very easily. And then looking on the belly for any uh, changes here of uh, skin changes or abnormalities. Same thing with the bones. Take a feel, kind of a squeeze at each of the bones. And then if you have a dog that you've worked with, they usually will let you look between the toes. Make sure there's not foxtails or anything there. And underneath, if they'll let you do that in each foot, that will help. And then 
after up yuppy buddy after they get up <laughs> come here up good boy stay uh, checking under the tail so looking in the back for symmetry change in muscles muscle mass um, if they see any lameness and then I always try to kind of look under the hood and make sure there's nothing under the tail that's worrisome all right go <laughs> There goes his treat. Always give a treat afterwards. You want it to be a good experience for your pet. Thanks. So uh, thank you for attending our quick overview of how to do a, an exam at home. And uh, now if you guys have some questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, this is a Amy Boyle here, and I'm just going to be um, helping Marianne out with questions so she can see uh, she can she can see what you guys have asked. And there's some really great questions here, so thank you for that. And feel free to add to them as uh, as we go. So, um, speaking of under the tail, Marianne, um, are anal glands best left to professionals, or or how do you um, advise people? That's a very good question. So there's certainly groomers that are comfortable taking care of anal glands if they're normal anal glands and there's not a medical issue like infection or inflammation, then I know that there's a lot of groomers. There's also a lot of pet owners that will learn how to do it themselves. Um, if there's a long-term anal gland problem, then talking to your veterinarian about putting fiber in the diet and other changes that can hopefully prevent them from being ongoing problems, our considerations. So it, it varies with your comfort, your dog's comfort, uh, for whether those can be something that can be expressed in a professional veterinary setting versus something that people will take on at home. And, and is, do you mind when your, when your clients ask you if, if you can show them how to do it or how, how does that usually happen? How does one learn? YouTube? YouTube's probably an option. I hadn't thought of that. I haven't watched the video, so I can't vouch for their authenticity. But I, I definitely, um, I think there's owners who ask to do it. And then if we, either the nurses or myself demonstrate that, they go, oh, I changed my mind. So it definitely uh, varies from pet to pet and comfort level. It, with some pets, you can express from them from the outside. It's a smelly uh, habit or it's a smelly thing that you have to do. Um, and gloves and all the cleanup crew uh, is necessary. But uh, it is one of those things that I'm pretty comfortable with. I think it varies from veterinary to veterinary and whether they'd be comfortable demonstrating that. But people who want to take that on, I think it's a reasonable thing to try at home. Thank you. Uh, here's another good question. You, uh, you, you showed some um, you know, fatty tumors and the importance of watching them. Um, when, when do they become a concern and, and should all lipomas be checked by a vet? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a really good uh, oncologist named uh, Susie Ettinger who basically says, um, if, you, if you can feel it, then you should aspirate it. And basically let's make sure everything is what we think it is because you can have something that feels like a fatty tumor that can be more serious. So the safest thing to do is to put a needle in it and pull those out. So a lipoma is gonna look very much like it just kind of a, like somebody put some Crisco on a slide. It's all just fatty stuff. And there's classic adipocytes, we call them under the microscope. But one of the things I'll talk to people about is um, sometimes I'll, I'll have a map. You can draw a map of your, of your dog and you can do things like get some calpers at the hardware store and measure you know, the angles so that you can have an objective measure of whether they're changing. And also, if it's not ulcerated, that's better. If it's ulcerated, you need to get to the vet. You can take photographs of it over time and then how it feels. So the fatty tumors are usually very kind of squishy. They feel like fat, um, massageable. And also they very rarely glom onto the muscle layer. And so if you can move it really well, that, that's a safer uh, thing to monitor rather than something that really gets it closely adhered. It could be closely adhered and still a benign lipoma, but it is something that I worry about when it starts to become firm and immovable. That's when you wanna make sure it's not changing into something a little more concerning. Um, what about um, CPR? Is it important to know CPR for, for your pet? 
You know, that's a very good question. And that's certainly something that we talked about having a future webinar on. I, I do think that that's a valuable thing. I, those who do more hiking out in the distance or dogs that do swimming and things like that is uh, good to know the basics. Uh, important things like what, when is an airway uh, compromised? Uh, if you think choking is a problem, figuring out ways to safely try and help your pet with that. So I, I think it's an individual decision. I think if people want to take classes on how to do CPR, it's a skill that might help them in, in a critical time. Um, I don't feel like, ooh, every pet owner should know CPR because I just feel like we hopefully catch things early and don't have to have that kind of critical skill. When you're, um, you know, when you're examining your dog and you're, you know, you, you kind of realize they, they need a bath, how, how often should you bathe a dog? That's a really good question and it varies. Um, so dogs who tend to make a lot of oil in their coat um, and uh, they'll catch a lot of dirt and they'll get dirtier sooner, probably should be bathed in that um, monthly or twice monthly pattern at least. I know a lot of the dermatologists that are treating underlying problems like infection or tendency to have fungus or yeast on the skin will recommend at least weekly baths if there's some propensity for the skin to become uh, affected by infectious agents. So it, it varies from pet to pet, but uh, I tend to say you know, you're probably okay at once a month or even once a quarter if you have a dog that stays pretty clean. Great. Um, if you, here's one, um, if my dog is licking his mouth a lot at night, does that maybe mean he's in pain? Ooh, that's a very good question. So pain is a very interesting thing. There's the obvious part where, you know, a lameness or carrying a leg or wincing away or winking an eye will give us clear evidence that there's some discomfort somewhere. Um, the three things I think of mostly for evidence of pain for dogs uh, outside of those things we just mentioned is panting. So dogs will pant when they're anxious or they're in pain, pacing and inability to settle. Um, I wouldn't say that licking their lips is necessarily an indication of pain. I do think it can be an indication of nausea or a problem in the mouth. Uh, and dental disease is one of those things. Also, dogs just like people can get a little bit of acid reflux. And so that can certainly cause some licking at night. Um, there's the questions are just rolling in. This is awesome. Um, uh, how, I, I know there's going to be a variety of answers to this, but how long does it take for a leg sprain to heal? Ooh, that is a good question. So, um, I usually, if it's a, what we call a soft tissue injury. So that means like a, you know, the equivalent of me taking a 10 mile hike when I haven't done any training and my muscles are sore. So I'm moving with, um, slow gimpy gait, that kind of thing should resolve in a, in a couple of days. So in those cases, if you have done some type of weekend warrior activity with your dog, making sure they have a, a bunch of water so that they can stay hydrated and get that lactic acid out of their body. But if it's something where they're not bearing weight at all, I'd get it checked sooner. Um, if it's an injury that's acute, I usually will tell people they should should improve significantly within three days. And if they don't get them into the vet, of course, it's not wrong to take them in earlier. But um, if, if it's truly just a soft tissue injury, you really should start seeing improvement in a couple of days. Great. Thanks, Marian. Um, Okay, so for those of us that have had dogs from of all ages, uh, starting at the very beginning, um, at what point do you become concerned about, you know, all the stuff that comes out of their body, whether it's urine or feces or vomit, you know, example, you know, you've got a puppy that starts each day with a pretty good normal poop and then they, you know, sort of develop softer, softer, softer over the day and, you know, at what, at what point do you kind of get concerned about it versus um, just keep watching? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's a, you know, certainly today we talked a lot about and, you know, putting your hands on your pet and your physical exam, which is a very different thing than your clinical signs. So vomiting, diarrhea, coughing, all of those things that are 
what I consider in the clinical sign category versus the physical exam category. So I usually say, you know, if it's an intermittent once in a while thing, for example, most dogs that go to the beach get so excited and eat enough, drink enough salt water that they're going to have diarrhea that day or the day after. But if it is a trend that's continuing and it's accompanied with other things, change in appetite, weight loss, nausea, um, straining, if the stool is just a little soft every once in a while, that's one thing. If you start to see blood or effort or a dog pooping six to 10 times a day versus the normal two to three times a day, then you start saying, okay, this isn't just loose stool. This is a bigger problem that involves the intestines. So it's a constellation of things, uh, frequency, severity, whether there's blood or concurrent other signs that the intestines have a problem. Those are things that would make me get into the vet sooner rather than watching. Great. Um, how can you, looking at it, here's a good cat question. Um, can you, can you tell anything about, you know, you talked about looking at gums to see if they're, you know, they've got good perfusion. Can you tell the same thing by, by looking at the color of ears of, of a cat? Ooh, that's a very good question. Cause if you have a cat, who's never going to let you look in its mouth, you can be a little bit stealth and try to catch them when they're yawning or grooming. So that lets you look at how pink their tongue is or when they do that yawn. I mean, Boris is pretty cooperative. So I, I got a good look for him, but that's not common with every cat. And actually in my own patients, I can tell how easy it's going to be to be, give a pill to a pet by doing an oral exam. Because if I'm having to pry their mouth open, then I know that I, I could talk to the owner about not trying to give pills to that cat because I can see how, how reluctant they are to open their mouth. So the ears certainly are an option, but you know, tabbies and some of those other cats don't necessarily have pink ears. So the other place you can look is on their pads. If they'll let you look at their pads, the cats will have either a pigmented or a cute little pink pad. And that's a good way to look at color if you're worried about things like anemia or just if you can't look at the gums, the pink parts of the pads is an alternative place to look for color. Great. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, this is a real challenge around here around uh, about foxtails and I know you mentioned them. So there's a question here about, you know, trips or tricks for foxtails and, you know, you showed an example of, um, of a, in between a dog's toes and there was, you know, you said something about a migrating foxtail. You know, if you see a toe that looks like that, what, what do you do? Do you see if it gets better? Do you go looking for the foxtail that you can't find anymore? Do you, you know, how, how can you avoid them or, or how can you, um, how can you detect them early when you can still do something about them? Yeah, good. Those are, that's a great question. Um, and it, there's a little, there's the face and nose one, and then there's the feet one. So we'll kind of address them separately. Obviously, if you can, and you have foxtails on your property, March is the time you want to start mowing them down and doing your best to stop them from drying out because the drier they are, the more pointy and the more capable of traveling through skin. Uh, there are people who will do things like if you're going to go somewhere where you know there's a whole bunch of foxtails, wearing booties is an option. Or after a hike or at the end of every day, just you know, get, teach your dog to roll over and look uh, between the pads. And usually what will happen is a foxtail will go between those pads and then try to move up between where the toe is and you'll actually, they'll actually go into that thin skin rather than just fall off. And certainly that picture I showed with the toe cyst, if somebody was looking at that and, and, and you know, gave it a squeeze and saw a foxtail poke out, you know, grab it. I, I don't think that's wrong, but you don't wanna be needing that because if it's an infection and there's no foxtail there, you're gonna make that worse. So that's what I do for the foot ones, daily checks, if you see that kind of interdigital cyst and you don't get a foxtail out, then getting into your vet and getting it looked at because there's a lot of other things that can cause that penetrating wounds from underneath. Um, bee stings actually can get in and start an infection. And then that pododermatitis I mentioned can be randomly through between toes and it's an infection and it's not necessarily a foreign material. And then with regards to the nose and the eyes and the ears, if you have a dog that you take out running through fields a lot, I actually learned this from a client. There's actually a little thing called outfox and you can Google it just outfox.com. 
and it's the equivalent of what horses wear to prevent themselves from to prevent fly strikes. So it's actually a, a fine net, and then you can put it over the dog's head. And when they're and it's the mesh is so fine, they actually can see through it okay, but it will stop foxtails from getting into their mouth or their nose or their ears. It's also something I recommend for my since I do endoscopy quite a bit, sometimes I'm taking things out of dogs, especially puppies, and I'll say especially retrievers, um, taking things out of their stomach or esophagus that's an inappropriate thing to eat. And so when they go grab pieces of bark or rocks out of the backyard, the out fox actually can stop them from picking up and swallowing something. So as long as your dog will tolerate it and it doesn't make you nervous as far as having it on their head, that's one way to prevent foxtails in the eyes and the ears and the nose. And then as far as um, foxtails getting into the ears, usually you have the dog that's gonna shake its head because it can feel that tickle in its ear. In best case, we can get that out at the vet hospital using without sedation and using our equipment. The nose foxtails are pretty characteristic. The dogs wrinkle up part of their face and they start sneezing and usually there'll be a little bit of blood coming out. They, Stuart, our, our example there actually sneezed a foxtail out once. He's also been put under anesthesia twice for foxtails up his nose. So they, they get up there. And if you see that, it's probably better to get it out sooner. Um, you know, within a day for sure. It's not like if it's two in the morning, probably going to your vet the next morning is okay, as opposed to going down to ER, although it's not wrong to go to ER. And the biggest problem is that those pointy foxtails can migrate anywhere. And if they get into the lungs, they, it doesn't take them long to start to move into the lung tissue and cause pneumonia and an infection around the lungs. So it's best with foxtails not to watch and wait uh, because they can continue to do damage. I've seen them in some pretty remarkable places of the body. Thanks, Dr. Birch. I, I had uh, a German Shepherd with a foxtail removed last year. It was quite interesting to see how it got to where it got to and what came out after a quite a long time. Um, re so related to that, when do you know when it's time to go to the emergency versus waiting to see your regular vet? Ooh, that's a good question. And I have to admit that with the advent of COVID, emergency service has been hugely impacted as the veterinary hospitals, a lot of the general practices closed on the weekend, closed early. And it's been a really heartbreaking thing for us to not be able to provide more prompt service for you know, the, the critical cases and then also the urgent care cases like foxtails. So uh, basically, if, you're, if your pet is not keeping water down, that's a done deal. If you know there's a toxin um, that has been exposed, they've been exposed to recently, they should get in there because things like you know, mushrooms and a lot of those toxins that um, they get exposed to. So sometimes it can be the difference between life and death, like chocolate for people say, oh, it shouldn't be too bad. There's actually, you can go on the internet and find what's a, called a chocolate wheel for how, how much your dog weighs and you can kind of speculate whether they're going to get in trouble. But the best thing is to get in and get them to vomit that. So uh, inability to drink, uh, lethargy and difficulty rousing them. Uh, the uh, obstructions, which usually are chronic vomiting, vomiting more than twice in a 24 hour period is concerning for an obstruction. And again, if there's foreign material in the intestines, it can, the intestines can be seriously damaged, life-threateningly damaged if you wait too long. So those are that and seizures and then coughing that's intractable. Those are things that I'd say shouldn't wait till the next day uh, for your regular vet. Obviously a dog who's got a real slight cough and it gets a little worse. It's not like you have to go in at midnight, but uh, those are things that I think heart failure can, can come on fast. And so the safest thing is to go to emergency with those different signs. And what about um, like, so, you know, sometimes they get upset stomachs or whatever and they won't eat. So, you know, if you have a cat that won't eat, how long do you, how long is it safe to wait before going to the vet just to see if it's nothing? Good question. So the other, the other signs you're looking for simultaneously, what's their attitude like? So if you have a cat that's like, oh, I don't feel like eating, but let's play with the string or well, don't let them swallow the, the string, but you let them, if they wanna play and they're behaving okay, um, if they're drinking water well, then I think it's reasonable to wait a day or a day and a half 
Um, also check, did you just open a new bag of food? Did you just try a new type of food? Cats are pretty amazing. I've had cats figure out when a bag of food is bad, when we can't, and they just won't eat it because they're smarter than that. So that's, that's, those are things that you'll want to think about if your cat stops eating. Cats, especially cats with a, any weight over about 10 pounds, should never go more than three days. Four days is the official scientific time not eating because they can actually create a liver disease called hepatic lipidosis if they go without any calories for more than three or four days. So you shouldn't, I'd say 24 hours by 36, you should be making an appointment to get them in to get them checked. Great. Um, what about um, kind of constant foot licking and, and is it, you know, is it necessarily allergy or, you know, dogs that are licking their feet and chewing at their nails, is, is, is that likely an allergy thing or is that a nervous thing or what, what are your thoughts? Um, all of the above. Um, so that's, that's a kind of a vague answer, but uh, again, that's where, you know, going to your veterinarian and kind of going through the checklist of what the environment's like. And I'm hoping that uh, itchy dogs and cats will be one of the lectures we can think about in the future because there's some very interesting ways to look at and approach that uh, stepwise to figure things out. So there's definitely dog people that feel like dogs lick dogs and cats lick areas that are painful uh, that have. So if you have like a wrist arthritis, is the dog licking it because there's a, it's a source of pain and they just don't know how to soothe it? So that's one possibility. Allergies. And we used to think that there were um, a lot more environmental airborne allergies. And there's been some amazing research that uh, the company Zoetis has done for blocking receptors for allergies. And so may, some people may have heard of Cytopoint, which is an injection that you can give that blocks some of those allergy receptors. But that's one of the things is that environmental allergies, food allergies certainly are thought to contribute to that. Um, and then boredom and habit are other things that people think about. So I have a lot of people that'll choose at the end of the day to use like some baby wipes to wipe the feet down to see if they decrease any allergens that might be on there. If you've recently changed food, look at that. And you can certainly say, okay, I'm gonna try a new food if you wanna test the food allergy uh, theory. And then if you have a dog that's compulsively doing that and gets to a point where the hair is going away or a cat, that gets red skin, then it's time to go to the vet and try to do that diagnostic tree with your veterinarian. What about um, dogs that will let you anyway? If, you know, if, they're, if their ears are dirty, what, what's the best way to clean them? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. If you're worried about an infection underlying and you don't know about the integrity of the eardrum, putting medication in there can cause some problems. There's a lot of ear cleaning solutions that are safe, whether regardless of how the drum looks, but definitely if you don't know what's happening or your dog's got really bad head tilt or really seems painful, I would go to the vet before I put anything in their ear to make sure that there's not a ruptured eardrum or some other big problem that, that home care won't solve. Um, but you can certainly clean the, the pinnas like Stuart's dirty ears. You can just use a wash rag to clean the, the inside. But as far as the canal, there's a lot of actually non-prescription ear cleaning things, epiotic and some other things. But if you have a good relationship with your veterinarian, you really should talk to them and ask what they recommend because they'll know your dog's tendency, whether yeast has been a problem before, whether they've had bacterial infections, whether they're earwax makers, and there's gonna be a whole bunch of proliferative earwax because that'll be a different solution than a cleaning solution or an anti-yeast solution. Um, what about the, you know, like a, particularly on a white dog, I guess, but, but sometimes like the fur on the bottoms of their feet, it gets sort of rust colored. Is that, is that normal? Ooh, that, uh, yes and no. So the licking that uh, we talked about a few questions ago, there's a lot of people that feel like that mahogany change, you know, along the side of the lips or uh, where the eyes are draining on white dogs or where they've been licking a lot. So sometimes that's a concern for in underlying infection. The people who've had the little white dogs with the tear staining tracks where they kind of have the brown, the brown clown tears, uh, there's some interesting, there's something called uh, angel eyes, which actually is an antibiotic or was an antibiotic. I think they've changed the ingredients subsequently, 
but there's a lot of theories that the imbalance in the bacteria in your GI tract can produce what we call porphyrins, which are things that color change the saliva and the skin. So there's a lot of theories about that. Uh, one is that you have a, have a bacterial uh, body change. Um, chronic inflammation can definitely change the color of the skin. You may see dogs that lick their bellies a lot. The bellies will get a little bit dark and freckled looking. So that pigment deposition is part of how the body deals with inflammation. So that mahogany change, certainly, if, especially if you have a dog that's licking a lot, get that checked out to make sure it's not a yeast infection or something else going on that's underlying. Thanks. Um, if my dog has blood in her stool, should I worry? Mm. Uh, if it's a, yes, you should worry. That's the short answer. Um, so there's different types of, of blood that we deal with. One's called melana, where it's more of a tarry digested blood. That's signs that there's bleeding higher up in the GI tract, like gastric ulcer or small intestinal disease. If you have bright red blood, then you have to worry about a, something going on at the, in the colon or in the lower intestines. If it's something that's a one-time thing, it's reasonable, especially if they've been to the beach or just ate a lot of grass or something. It's, a, it's something you make a note of, uh, calendars are great, whether it's your phone or wall calendar, had some blood in the poop. If it's happening multiple times, get it checked out for sure. Uh, if it's a one-time random thing, you know, they will sometimes eat something weird that can cause a little bit of trauma. But it, again, we have to look at the whole picture. If this is a perfectly normal dog that had a little bit of blood in its poop or cat too, that you found a little streak of blood on there and everything else is perfectly fine and normal, that's a very different situation than an animal who's not eating and has blood in its poop or doesn't feel good. So you need to look at uh, the constellation of signs uh, before you dismiss something. Thank you. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, the importance of checking their, your pet's teeth and dental care and, and, you know, dental, dental care, dental cleaning for pets is, you know, it's, it's not inexpensive because you have to have them, you know, sedated at least, but um, so can a couple of questions here related to that. So one is, you know, how, how long can you wait or how often should you get your dog's teeth clean? Um, and what do you think about things like greenies for cleaning dogs' teeth, those, you know, whatever that doesn't have to be greenies, but you know, those tooth cleaning bones kinds of things. And, you know, do you, should you be brushing their teeth? Ideally, yes. And actually I'm hoping one of our webinars that when we, before we had the benefit of technology, uh, one of our lecture series was actually dental disease. And I'm hoping I can get uh, Dr. Hetler who gave that presentation to come on and do a webinar later this year, talk, answering those questions with a little more detail. The best situation is to get them, if, you're, if you have an older dog that has a lot of dental disease, like that photograph we showed, then if you can swing it to get the, the dentist redone so that you have a prophylactic and you can start from a clean mouth and start getting in the habit of brushing their teeth. And that's training, that's um, making it really fun, you know, after they get a treat, trying to find good tasting toothpaste and stuff like that. So there's no real answer. I do know that cost becomes a big concern. And certainly that's one of the things with Birchbark's other arm of financial assistance that we wanna to try to help those pets whose life, quality of life or life are compromised by dental disease because you can get abscesses and dogs actually, their, their tooth roots almost go into their nasal cavity. And so dachshunds and some of those long snouted dogs will end up with secondary issues when, they're dental, when they have dental disease that goes unchecked. And so in that respect, uh, it's an ideal thing to get it done. I understand that it's pretty costly and sometimes there's an inability to, to reach that, to provide that cost or the finances for that. And that's a conversation you should have with your veterinarian and say, you know, how, how bad are their teeth? Is there enough gum disease for us to say, let's, you know, figure out a payment plan or do it during dental month or something like how, how, important is it from your perspective as a veterinarian? And it's very important, I think, for every, this is part of the advocacy for every one of us to say, I have financial constraints. I can't, I'm limited here. What kind of alternatives do you offer for my particular dog? 
I do think that mechanical, just like flossing for us, mechanical movement of tartar is, um, can be done with the right kind of things. There's additives you can put in the water that are supposed to change the type of plaque and make it less adherent. Um, there is actually a, an accredited veterinary dental um, uh, website you can go to where the group has said these, these are acceptable toothpastes and other supplements and chew toys. Greenies are one, one of the big things about greenies when they first came out, um, people weren't very particular about what size you should give your dog. And there was actually quite a few dogs who got them lodged in their esophagus and they caused enough problems to cause a class action suit. This is coming on 20 years ago now, but that's one thing that people have to be really careful about. If you're giving a dental treat to clean the teeth, make sure your dog chews on it. It's not something they gulp down because that's not going to do anything for the teeth, especially you know, if it sits in the stomach, uh, it's, it's not cleaning the teeth. That's great. Um, I want to, I know we're just three minutes to the hour. And so I wanted to, there are a couple of more questions that um, I will, um, if, if you've asked a question and your name is attached to the question, we, we will do our best to get through your registration email and answer back to you. Um, unfortunately, anonymous ones, we won't be able to, um, we won't be able to answer, but I wanted to turn things back over to um, Dr. Birch and to Michelle just to wrap things up. And thank you, Dr. Birch, for answering all these rapid fire questions. Thank you. They were great questions. Thank you, Amy, for your help with that. Hi, everyone. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Birch. Um, I know I'm about to go do a couple exams myself, so <laughs> I wonder how many of us are gonna be headed that way. Work into it slowly. It's not yeah. like, you, I mean, <laughs> obviously Boris and, and uh, Stuart have been through this before. So uh, one of the things you wanna make sure you do is make it fun, uh, make it exciting, have something really great afterwards, whether it's rubby dubs and, or treats. So don't forget the fun part. Wonderful. And uh, thank all of you so much for joining us. We hope that it was informative. We hope that it was enjoyable. We are going to go ahead and send out an email tomorrow with the full recording. Um, so you will have that. And then along with the email, we will have a quick survey. And it would be really helpful if you can take a few moments to let us know your feedback um, and ideas or interests that you might have to help us plan our next series that are coming up. Um, on a final note, I'm so glad that all of us are able to do this together. I think we are enjoying many brighter and more hopeful days with um, a really tough 2020. And the need for birch bark more than doubled in 2020. And it's only together and with people like you who care about the human animal bonds and all of our friends and supporters and our veterinary partners that we're able to meet that need. So we are very grateful. Um, and as Amy said, for those of you who had wonderful questions, we will absolutely do our best to get those answered for you. So thank you again. Um, we hope everyone has a wonderful evening and we're so glad you could join us. Thank you, everyone.